So can I test this one? So, okay. So, okay. so you will like change the screen to this one. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, no, no, no. yeah. Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today uh, in this student seminar organized by one of our student organization, SDSA. Uh, today we have two interesting talks lined up. Uh, one of the talk will be presented by Professor Yunian and another by one of our PhD colleagues, Sian. So first, uh, let me introduce Professor Yan. So he is an associate professor in our department who works in quite a few exciting frontiers of statistics, uh, which includes like Bayesian inference, uh, data-driven optimization, and some theoretical foundations of high diversity statistics, just to name a few. Uh, today, he'll be talking about statistical learning and computation via optimal transport. So let's welcome Professor Yang with a round of applause. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. So yeah, this will be the title. So uh, basically I'm going to discuss some of our recent works regarding how to apply the transport, optimal transport theory in statistics. And if you look at the, how many times these keywords optimal transport or maybe worst stand distance appeared in the title of some recent like conference um, publications or so general publications, it has almost exponential uh, growth. So you can see that this is kind of more and more popular field. Okay, so to start with, I just use this single slide to give you some very basic introduction of what is optimal transport and what is the problem. So roughly speaking, you can think about optimal transport problem concerns the following. So say we have two distributions, one is represented by this uh, blue uh, contour and one is based, based on this orange um, plot. Then the problem is we want to transport or move. So if you think about both distributions as a pile of sands, then we just want to move one pile to another while minimize our total efforts, where in this case, you can see what efforts is the total number of distance we move for each sense when we transfer one to another. So mathematically, you can think about this can be formulated to this optimization problem, which is called the Mong's formulation. So this is the earliest formulation uh, in the literature, although um, actually this formulation is not the right one to use because there are some regularity issues. The info might not be, um, be um, attended, but anyway, so this is the most easy way to understand optimal transport problem is we want to find some map T. In this case, you can think about the map will be the map transfer one probably uh, one pi of sand to another, and we want to minimize the total efforts. So here you can think about we use the quadratic cost to characterize the cost, which is the distance, so X minus TX. So this is the initial position uh, and this is the target position and we compute what's the L2 norm, then we take a square. Then we just consider the dist distance average over the initial probability measure mu, which is this blue one. And the subjective the constraint that we want after the transfer, the distribution becomes new. So mathematically, this means if you think about this T as a map from say RD to RD, then the push forward uh, measure after you apply this T to the source measure mu becomes your target measure mu, which is this pile. So this uh, is the definition of the optimal transport problem. So uh, you can see that from this definition, there are two major components. One is the total number of efforts itself, which is the objective value from this problem. And another key component is this measure. So how you move one pile to another. And it turns out that both those components uh, is quite useful uh, in a lot of uh, statistical problems. So in particular, so the first component is the object value itself. So it turns out that this particular, you can see about the cost uh, defines the closeness between those two distributions, right? Because if you expect those two distributions to be very different, then you may need to have a huge cost in order to move one to another. 
So in other words, you can think about this particular objective value defines a distance. Actually, it's a squared distance. We take a square root of this value. So this is so-called two worse than distance. And it turns out that distance, uh, distance has a lot of advantages over some traditional distance, such as L2, LP, Hellinger, what a uh, KL divergence in a sense that they are, it, this distance is particularly suitable for characterizing closeness between mutually singular distributions. So mutually singular, you can think about if you have a two dimensional space, then if two distributions, they have disjoint support. So the support is the uh, area where the density value is positive, then they are mutually singular. So in that case, you can, uh, if you think about the traditional um, distance function, they usually does not make sense. For example, if you think about the KL divergence, that usually goes to infinity, diverges for singular distributions. And then for the classical ones, such as total variation or L2 or L1, source distribution is also not capable of describing source distribution, uh, source the closeness between source distributions because they will be constant. And another uh, advantage of the worst and distance is that it can capture some physical closeness that are not captured by some traditional distance. For example, again, if you look at this figure, we have three distributions indicated by the blue, red, and the green curves. Then you can think about it physically. So the blue one should be uh, further away from the green one than the red one, right? Almost should be twice distance. But if you look at the, say, L1 distance, total variation distance, or Hellinger distance, they are both constant. If you compute what's the Hellinger distance between blue and the red one or blue and green one, they're just constant. They are not changing as you uh, move the location of those two piles. So again, this is primarily because source distance only care about what the density. So they don't care about where the high density region are, but they only care about the relative allocation of the densities. But if you look at the worst distance, because it directly taking into account this distance, so you can see that this distance between blue and the green will be twice as large as the red to um, green. So that makes sense in this particular instance. And also you can think about for this example, actually those two distributions, they are mutually singular because they have different support, right? Their support is uh, disjoint. So because this, uh, so one application of the optimal transport is in classroom. So you think about, say we have this very famous MNIST data set, which is a benchmark data set in computer vision. And say we have 10 digits. We can think about each digit corresponds to a cluster. And say if you want to class a future object uh, image into one of those 10 <laughs> categories, then uh, because uh, for images, it's a two dimensional uh, kind of object, but usually you can vectorize it into a high dimensional vector where the vector corresponds to the pixel intensities for those images. Then one distance you can use to do classroom because for classroom, you have to have some kind of closeness measure, right? If two images, they're close to each other, then you may expect them to be from the same class. So for this case, uh, the raw L2 distance actually is very bad metric, partly because you can say for images, if you do some small rotation or translation, this should be the same image. It should correspond to the same object. But if you think about the L2 norm, if you do some slight translation, the support becomes different. So this will drastically change the L2 distance. So which means this distance is not a good one to use. And also for images, you can actually view this as a two dimensional distributions uh, correspond to what's the allocation of the intensities of the pixels. So that means actually what standard distance will be a better metric to characterize those things, especially because it concerns the physical distance. You can think about for those the same figure, if you rotate it, it's just correspond to a small trans, uh, change of the position of the image, which makes the Watson distance quite small. And if you think about different digit, because they have some different shapes, you may uh, do some dramatic change in order to match them. So this makes the Watson distance uh, within cluster to be small, however, between class to be large. And then uh, when we know that classically, if we want to do clustering, we can do k-means. Here, the most uh, natural idea is we can replace the usual distance in the k-means with the Watson distance. So this leads to the Worse than k means. Actually, this is a joint work with um, our student Yu Bo and uh, Xiao Hui, where we just consider, say, find the cluster membership but minimize this total sum of square within cluster worse than distance. And another interesting um, property, actually, fact, which is specific to this worse than clustering, is that it is very different from the usual Euclidean case because we know 
the Euclidean space is flat space in a sense that uh, there are usually two different formulations of k-means in the Euclidean case. They are both equivalent. One is called distance-based, one is centroid-based. So distance-based, you can think about, we want to minimize, say, the total within class, uh, class uh, distance. In that case, we only need to know the distance, but the centroid base is more like an iterative algorithm where we first, for each cluster, based on its current member, we find what's the center, say what's the, if you clean the case, just a sample mean. Then for any future object or image, we just identify the cluster by finding what's, which cluster center is closest to this particular instance, then we send the member to that cluster. Then we can kind of iterate this procedure every time we have the current membership, we fit the center, then based on center, we improve our cluster uh, membership of each object, then we iterate with the hope that this algorithm will converge. So uh, this just corresponds to a different kind of objective function when we want to uh, fit in those objects into different clusters. And in the Euclidean case, it can be proved that those two perspective or objective function actually they're equivalent. Again, this is because of the flatness of the Euclidean space or the uh, parallelogram law holds, which means if you have a parallelogram, uh, then the total sum of square of the four edges equals to the sum of square of the two diagonals. But in a worst time space, it's different because this, this space, if you think about this as a space, infinite dimensional space, this is not a flat space. It has some negative coverage when the dimension is higher than one. So in that case, those two procedures will be different, but we actually can, we argue that for this case, the central base method actually is much worse because in this case, the notion of center is quite irregular, it's ill-defined in a sense that it's usually is not representative of each individual clusters, making this method not working well or comparable to distance-based one. So this method is based on the distance. It only requires the pairwise distance. Okay, so uh, the first application is regarding the, say the first component of optimal transport is about the distance uh, induced by its definition. So another component as I mentioned is the map itself. So this is particularly useful in nowadays uh, machine learning problems about generative models, because uh, this you can actually also view generative modeling as a classical statistical problem, which means we want to estimate what's the underlying distributions um, from the data. But if you think about it in practice, usually we are not interested in the density of distribution itself, but we're interested in how we can generate samples from that distributions, which will correspond to generative modeling. Say if we want to generate some new images that is synthetic, but real, uh, look realistic to the existing ones. Then you can think about this, the problem of generative modeling. Then because of this, you can think about the transmodal map itself gives you a very natural way to design a generating mechanism. For example, if we think about this mu zero, as our uh, source mu and this new, the target to be the, our target distribution corresponds to the data distribution. Then we, the sampling is very simple. We just sample a X from mu zero. Then we just apply this map to that X. Then according to that constraint, which is this one, we know that the um, corresponding TX will have the distribution mu, which is our desired the distribution, which means sampling is very easy. We just find a such map, then we just, apply this map to the, a bunch of random samples. So this actually leads to a very famous uh, generating uh, generative model schemes, which called versus 10 generative, mod, uh, generative adversarial network, uh, which nowadays has, I think, um, attend more than 10,000 citations, although it's a uh, relative recent work. So the idea is also quite simple. So it's, ba it's based on the worst 10 optimal transport where we consider say, now we are not using W2, but we use a different um, trans optimal transporter loss, which is based on the um, L1 norm, not L2 norm. And we want to say, find the best transporter map T, which is usually modeled by neural networks, <coughs> such that we want to minimize, say the samples generated from this particular T and the two say empirical distribution of the data. Then we just minimize this problem. You can think about uh, this is actually a minimax problem. So actually it has some issues in computation wise, but anyway, this is a very natural idea in order to fit such a map based on the samples from the data. So you can see that for this formulation, we're not explicitly estimating the distribution, which somehow is not useful anyway, but we just directly try to make our sampling scheme to match our target. And another a very uh, important thing here is 
here the W1 distance actually admits a very nice dual formulation. So if you think about this as a the primal formulation of your optimization, then you can also talk about a dual. So dual takes this form. So it'd be the say if we think about the W1 distance between two distributions, mu and nu. So this can be computed as the largest possible difference over all f that is one Lipschitz. So this is the expectation of f and the mu, and this is expectation of f and the nu. So we just find the some function that is one Lipschitz that maximize this expectation difference. Then the largest possible discrepancy is the W1 distance. So this is particularly useful because again, uh, you can see that this definition does not rely on mu and nu to share the support or they can be, uh, they can be mutually singular, but still this give you some non or some uh, reasonable values. And another thing is that here we consider this particular one Lipschitz function class, but actually it can be generalized to more general function class. And some of the choices lead to other um, commonly used distance metrics. Okay, so uh, then another thing is about the general models is we know that uh, I think one of the uh, reason why neural network works so well or expand the success of those methods is because they are trying to utilize some low dimensional structures, although they uh, most often they are implicitly used in those structures. If you think about uh, with the neural networks, which you know that if it's deep, you have many blocks, have many hidden layers, then you can somehow interpret each hidden layer as give you some sort of future expression, which means it gives you some kind of latent space representation of the original image. So to further kind of make this idea implementable, so there's one class of method in the literature, in the literature called autoencoder. So the idea is very simple. So we first uh, find some encoder, which in this case they would denote by G. So it maps from original say high dimensional space, say if an image, to a smaller dimensional space where, uh, sorry, here's the encoder. So from RD to R small d, where say we think about the latent space is much, much smaller than the dimension of the original space. Then you can think about this as a huge uh, data compression into a few number of features. Then we also have a decoder, which plays the role of reconstructing the signal. So we map this low dimensional feature back into the original space and it corresponds to a reconstructed image. So with the hope that after the reconstruct, after the encoding decoding pair, so we are almost going to recover the original image. If that's the case, then it means that the original data actually admits some low dimensional structures because it can be characterized by only a few number of latent features. And uh, in practice, we, uh, we can always implement this method just by designing some sort of criterion to match those two that would just minimize, say, over optimize over all decoder encoder pair to minimize say, the reconstruction error. And the one particular instance in the literature is called a variational autoencoder, which uses variational inference as a way to design such a uh, criterion to match those two objects. And actually uh, we have a recent work uh, with student Rong Tang, where we analyze um, the excess risk of this um, method from uh, using the lens of M estimation and we can show that under certain conditions, you can get actually consistent recovery of the underlying distribution. Anyway, so you can see that in source um, uh, genetic modeling procedures, this low dimensional structures plays a very important role. There are natural questions. Actually, this is also, you can think about an application of optimal transport in the theoretical analysis of genetic models. Is that say, if we assume, we think about genetic modeling as an implicit distribution estimation method. And I think if we think about a general loss function, which characterizes how, what you do in terms of estimating the unknown density. So here, this requires as adversarial loss with a general discriminator class. So this actually extends the previous W1 distance where we replace this space with a generic function space. So depending on how large this function class, you can think about this defines either a weak distance or a strong distance. And a W1 distance is a special case when you take this F to be the space of leap, uh, one Lipschitz function, right? And here we assume say the data lies on a D-dimensional space. So more rigorously, we assume it to be a manifold. It can be nonlinear, does not have to be a linear space. Otherwise it will be relatively simple. So in that case, so the theoretical question is for those genetic models, how can you utilize those low dimensional structures? Or in other words, if we know the data is indeed low dimensional, what is the fundamental lower bound, what is the best thing you can do in terms of density estimation, then we derived that the minimax rate in this case 
is composed of three terms. So the first term corresponds to the usual parametric rate, which you can never beat. So you have this term here. And then the middle term corresponds to um, the classical minimax rate of estimating a say, R for smooth density, given that we know what is this low dimensional space. But in practice, we know that we, know, we don't know what's the low dimensional structures. Usually there's a field called manifold the learning. You are trying to learn this space. So this is actually why we have the third term, which can be interpreted as the risk paying for not knowing what is this space. So you have to uh, pay extra risk in terms of estimating this uh, space. And here, uh, this way depends on multiple characteristics, including the smoothness level of the underlying distribution, what's the manifold smoothness, and what is the smoothness corresponding to your discriminator class, defining this adversarial loss. If it is the Lipschitz class, then this gamma will be one. By the way, so Rotan, um, still on the job market, so actually we have a um, job talk rehearsal for her. If you're interested in know more about those works, uh, you can, uh, you're welcome to attend her rehearsal, which will be on December 5th. If you want to know the location, you can send me, uh, send me an email. I will let you know uh, what the exact time and the location. Okay, so, uh, so the last application I'm going to talk about in this uh, talk is in Bayesian inference. Actually, this is, can be more general. So uh, it's generally applied to any problem where you, interest, you are interested in minimizing uh, some functional that is defined on a space of, of all probability measures. This can be also applicable to some other, say, um, problem in applied math mathematics, or if you, uh, in computer vision, say, if you want to do some kind of image regularization, denoising, in painting, then it's all corresponds to learn so optimize certain distributions, um, so certain function over the distributions, where in that case, the distribution corresponds to images subject to some constraint. So, but here we just consider a concrete instance, which is Bayesian inference. So we know that in Bayesian inference, usually we are mainly interested in the post zero distribution, right? But uh, if you take 5.11, you know that usually the main difficulty in computing the posterior is because of the unknown normalizing constant, which makes uh, you usually you have to use some numerical method to do the computation. But anyway, so the ultimate goal in Bayesian inference is not to estimate what's the density value, but usually still you are interested in generating some samples, right? You want to use some posterior samples to do the inference. In, for example, construct some credible sets, et cetera, or do some hypothesis testing of say the parameter larger than some threshold then it's based on the posterior probability, which can be estimated by Monte Carlo sampling from these distributions. So anyway, so uh, it turns out that um, this uh, particular problem of finding the posterior can be boils down to solving an optimization problem, which is minimize the care divergence between rho and the rho star. Here rho star say is the, is the target posterior distribution. And the benefit of using care divergence is that even though we don't know what is the normalizing constant in front of rho star, but because this we know is integration of rho times log rho over rho star. So that particular constant will only appear as a additive constant independent of rho, which means in order to minimize this functional, we actually don't, do not have to know the, not, the additive constant, but we can still proceed say by using any uh, numerical methods. And also the care divergence actually plays a central role in statistics. If you're familiar with the asymptotic theory, you know that solving MLE asymptotically is trying to minimize the care divergence between P theta and the P theta star if P theta star is a true underlying distribution. So anyway, so this is kind of the generic formulation of a Bayesian inference in terms of the optimization perspective. Then again, because this is an optimization, we can actually use optimal transport to solve this. Actually, there's be two perspective. One is the usual static version of optimal transport, which means we don't care about how we uh, are going, what's the specific path from our initial distribution to row star, but we just care about a map that directly maps, say, the row star, which is our initial distribution to the target posterior. Then we just need to parameterize this T in a proper way and directly optimize over this T uh, to solve this minimizing problem. Then we can get the map. So this actually is joint work with um, uh, some earlier student, Wei Han and Ke Li, uh, where we're trying to investigate certain property about this map and how we can incorporate some theoretical property of T into the competition. And it turns out that this particular method is better, uh, is ver very nice because it has very nice interpretation as well as gives you very accurate approximation to the posterior. 
However, this, this one drawback of this method is that when you optimize this T, usually you also want to introduce a bunch of parameters, say if you want to parameterize T with the neural networks. Then when you optimize those parameters, if you view this optimization problems as over those parameters, this is actually a highly non-convex problem. And if you apply some kind of standard method such as gradient ascent, you are actually not utilizing the geometry underlying this problem to help you optimize these parameters. This makes the algorithm actually quite a sensitive to initializations. So this is one of the drawbacks of this static view of optimal transport. So that's uh, actually uh, motivates a second way of doing that, which is a dynamic perspective, which is achieved by so-called versus time gradient flow. So which the idea is instead of finding directly matched row zero to row star, we try to find a continuous path over the space of all probability uh, distributions that connects row star and row. Then it depends on how we design this path. It's usually designed under certain kind of uh, intuition, such as we want to be steep descent relative to some metric. And this actually is a joint work with Yun Tian Yao, who is also in the audience. So, um, and also uh, probably uh, before I talk about what's the meaning of this worst and flow, let's give me, uh, give you more kind of historical description of what's this method. So originally this idea of worst and flow is first introduced in applied ma uh, mathematics where the idea is we, uh, they want to use this kind of tool <coughs> as a theoretical tool to analyze some asymptotic property of partial differential equations, because we know for a lot of partial differential equations is very hard to analyze it. But it turns out that a number of common partial differential equations, such as diffusion equations, or uh, so uh, porous medium equations, they can all be uh, viewed as a versus time gradient flow of certain energy function relative to the W2 distance. So here the worst time distance is precisely the one that defines that uh, optimal transport with project loss. Uh, and conversely, later people found that this is not only a theoretical tool, but actually you can use this to help you uh, design some better method for numerical approximation of PDEs, which is usually better than some classical methods such as uh, the finite element method essential. And uh, recently actually people found this particular uh, object is very useful even in machine learning or in statistics. And uh, the first probably usefulness of this notion in theoretical uh, machine learning is they, uh, because we know that usually um, for neural network, uh, if you want to fit it, it's a highly non-convex problem. It has a lot of local minimum, but people somehow find that some very simple algorithms such as the cast gradient uh, works particularly well in these tasks. Then people want to understand why. And there's one uh, theoretical uh, work showing that at least for shallow networks, if you have only one layer, then the gradient ascent method over all the parameters for that particular problem can be viewed as a particle approximation to a particular versus time gradient dynamics relative to uh, of certain energy relative to the W2 distance. And also for this particular energy function, it is a convex under certain notions, which means uh, any algorithm, because if you have convexity, you know that uh, it is computationally that to be a simple task. Then it explains why, say, those gradient set works so well, at least for shallow new, uh, new, new, new network fittings. Anyway, so. You can see that this particular tool is kind of useful, not only as, as a theoretical tool, but also as a computational uh, tool. So here, uh, the idea is again, we want to use this particular framework to solve this Bayesian optimization problems to design a gradient flow to solve this KR divergence functional. And another thing is that uh, even though this uh, is in principle uh, correct, but a lot of cases we have very complicated models which might be high dimensional or may involve many discrete components. So this will still make uh, a naive, say, all some gradient flow uh, computationally difficult due to, say, curse of dimensionality, or maybe due to the discrete part, you have to design some particular algorithm. Then there's one solution that actually we did uh, with, in this work with, we can apply some kind of variational approximation. The idea is, although the original space is too complicated, but we can always approximate this huge space with some simple ones, with the hope that the simple one will not incur too much approximation bias. So anyway, so um, yeah, I think I don't have much time left. Probably uh, I will use the uh, next uh, few minutes to briefly uh, explain what is this thing, what is worse than gradient flow and how it is related to usual, say Euclidean uh, gradient flow. 
So in a Euclidean case, we know that uh, the gradient flow is usually associated when we want to optimize some function, right? Say we have some function which is d-dimensional, say it is smooth and we want to minimize this function. Then the gradient flow uh, correspond is usually characterized by an ordinary differential equation, which is say the derivative of x equals to the negative gradient of this f at some initialization. And this is called a gradient flow because it is the steepest descent in terms of decreasing the object value so it gives you the fastest possible decrease relative to the L2 norm. So you can see the derivative of this F is always negative and the, the magnitude is proportional to the square of the L2 norm of the gradient. And in practice, this is a continuous um, object. We cannot do this, but usually we can do some time discretization. So just use some Euler approximation for this ODE, you can get this say, gradient set, which is the usual algorithm you can apply. So you, Every time you um, update the next iteration based on minus tau times the gradient of the current gradient. And then you can expect this to be the Euclidean one, then how we can extend it to the, say, worst than case. It turns out that here, this gradient notion is not actually well defined in a general metric space that is not Euclidean. Because Euclidean space, we know that you can have the inner product, it's a, match, uh, it's a um, normal space. But for the worst than space, so the space of all distributions embedded with the worst than metric, this is not inner product space. You don't have inner product. So that means you cannot define a gradient, which means we need some, we need to have some more general notions in order to extend this to a worst than case. So this uh, actually calls me to a very, two very interesting um, views of how to view this gradient flow. So we know that this perspective uh, specification of the gradient flow is via ordinary differential equation. But in fluid mechanics, we know that there are usually two ways to uh, describe a motion or a gradient flow. So imagine that we have many particles with density zero, zero at zero, and they are moving according to some gradient flow, which means each particle move ac um, according to this ODE. So it gives you the flow equation. Then we can always describe this in two ways. So one way is just by this ODE, which is kind of microscopic description, we describe the status of each particle at each time. So what's the velocity, what's the position? However, there's another perspective is called a uh, Eulerian specification, which is through a PD, partial differential equation. It's more of a microscopic description where we're interested in describing how many particles share the same status at each, at each time. So this leads to the PD, which is called a continuity equation. So it's saying that say the local um, time derivative of the density, so the change of the density equals to the net flow in and flow out of the mass at that particular region. So this is just the divergence of rho t times the velocity. So here, because you interpret the time derivative at the velocity of the particle at each time t, right? So this would be the, so rho t times the velocity. It turns out that this particular PD uh, characterization of the gradient flow is extendable. It can be extended to a general metric space. So in a case, if we're interested in worse than space. So this leads to the notion of worse than gradient flow. But the only difference is we have a different velocity. Now it's not a gradient, but takes this uh, form. So it's a gradient of, so here say we have some functional that we want to minimize. And then we can define it's a functional derivative, which is called the first variation, or you can think of the two derivative in the usual uh, functional sense. Then we take the derivative of the gradient of this particular um, first variation. So this leads to the velocity in the worst than case. So this essentially also describes what's the velocity of a particle at each position, but now it also depends on the entire distribution, not only depends on single um, value it's current position, but depends on the overall distribution. So this in some sense can be viewed as a worst than version of the gradient. Then uh, for this particular one, it defines the worse than gradient flow. So in a mathematical way, you can show that this equation is well defined under certain regularity assumptions. And also it is the st steepest descent relative to the W2 metric in a sense that if you think about the time derivative of this function of relative to T, then it will be the negative, the square. So here is L2 square relative to mu T. Mu T is the measure, the distribution at the time T. So it should be rho T, not mu T. So of this um, functional square. So also it's negative. So it's uh, always a non-increasing algorithm. So again, uh, if we consider the, our original instant, uh, example of um, Bayesian inference where we care about the k divergence, 
So which means here the functional takes the form of two parts. One is the potential energy corresponding to the V, which defines your say target, the exponent in your target distribution. And also there's a self entropy term. So uh, to try to avoid your then mass to be collapsed into a single point. Then you can apply the previous formulations to derive what's the corresponding PD. It's very interesting. So in that case, so this is velocity. And if you plug in the velocity back into the continuity equation, you can get the fork Planck equation, which is a very famous equation in physics describing the evolution of particles, some projectiles, some random uh, perturbation, and uh, some, uh, for, uh, some internal force. And this also corresponds to the law of a, say, a xt from a stochastic differential equation, or called the long jamming dynamics. So anyway, so um, yeah, probably I'm going to skip so. So here, this is almost a continuous uh, kind of description, but in practice, again, this is not uh, implementable. In practice, we have to do some numerical approximation. So one way to do that is do some time discretization by discretize this uh, scheme. Actually, this leads to a very famous scheme, but I'm not going to talk about the details. It's called the JKL scheme. And uh, actually, we have some results showing that under a certain convexity notion that generalized the usual convexity in the Euclidean space, because again, this is not a uh, flat space. So we have to, when define convexity, we cannot define as a convexity along the segment, but it should be along certain geodesics for that space. So geodesic means the short length curve that connects two distributions. Then under certain convexity along geodesics, we still have say, some sort of geometric convergence. This uh, converts exponentially fast, this type of one step discretization of the continuous gradient flow. And this again, so if you think about the divergence functional, this convexity is implied by the convexity of the potential itself. So also uh, in the literature, there are some numerical methods because again, this is a functional optimization. At the first side, it is not very easy to solve because it again involves some row over the function space. But here, because we introduce some step size, so this is significantly easier than solving the original problem because optimizer well, row is usually very close to your starting point. Then in addition, there are a bunch of methods, say particle approximation, or by using some functional Lagrangian multiplier called the normal rene formula. Or you can use some uh, fancy neural network, neural network approximation based on functional approximation. Actually, this is one uh, ongoing work with my student, Lin Junhuang, who is also in the audience. We're trying to make this kind of um, implementable for say high dimensional problems and using the input convex neural network. And then again, uh, there's some drawback is also this method again, will suffer from cost of dimensionality so that we might want to use some kind of approximation scheme to solve this. Okay, so to summarize, um, in this talk, I briefly described some interesting application of optimal transport theory in statistics and machine learning. And we talk about two different formulation, one is the static formulation of OT, which defines the worst metric. And this metric particularly is very useful for clustering and the generative modeling of high dimensional, say, distributions with low dimensional structures, which is not, um, cannot be achievable by using traditional metrics. And as the dynamic formulation on the other side, which is worst sanguine flow, is very useful for designing new computational algorithms and also has some deep connections with partial differential equations. You can use the theory from those things to analyze the partial differential equations as well. And of course, there are uh, the conclusion is that it's still a lot of open problems and opportunities in this field. So if you're interested, you can um, find a lot of recent works on this field, in this field. Okay, uh, yeah, that concludes my talk. Thank you, everyone. So yeah, let me know if you have any question about those topics. How do you choose your Yeah, that's uh, depends on, uh, usually it's user spec uh, specified. A lot of cases say if uh, probably most traditional one, you can use some one that is easy to compute. For example, if you use W1, that is fairly easy to compute. You can actually model the discriminant class using new network, then you just put some cap constraint on the coefficient. You can show that in that case, it gives you this function class. But in practice, again, depends on your choice. Usually you choose the function class to make your calculation to be simple. But again, theoretically, you can, of course, choose this to be complicated if you don't care about how to compute it. So for every function class, you have to you know, compute this different, different way? Or... Yeah, you have to solve this optimization problem. 
But depending on your choice, for some problem, probably you have a closed form, for others, probably not, depending on how you choose it. Uh, yes. Can I ask on slide five then? This follows up on who was asking. So mm. is the general idea here that you've got uh, a problem and you're looking at this T star, and then in the work uh, by Arjovsky, what they're trying to do is approach this uh, by using, yeah, the function class one elliptic functions. So is that claim that uh, this is computationally easy or you were saying something deeper that this has uh, very nice properties yeah, for this particular one, like I said, you can easily implement this one by one optimization over a particular neural network where you put some constraint on the coefficient. You can show that that particular neural network class corresponds to this one Lipschitz function class. So you just need to usually use gradient standard to optimize that neural network, which plays the role of discriminator in this definition. Got it. Yes, this is not chosen for convenience. Yeah, this again is for computational reasons. Again, okay. but of course, in practice, you can also use some other metric, which probably is also easy to compute if you think about uh, the maximum uh, mean discrepancy, which is another useful uh, distance, which where you, here you place the function class to be reproducing kernel Hilbert space. And in that case, you also have a closed form expression for this distance. So anyways. Yeah. So uh, regarding the motivation in the Bayesian inference, hmm. we wanted to sample from uh, rho star. Right. The posterior was complicated to sample from, but we know how to sample from rho. Uh, yeah, you you like row uh, this row zero. You you, you so can choose it. Okay. Yeah, you can choose to be very simple, say multi normal or anything. You, so how does this approach compare to the existing standard methods such as metropolis testing? So yeah, metropolis testing. Uh, because again, so if you uh, know about literature, so usually metropolis testing algorithm is still trying to uh, solve an sampling problem or an integration problem because you know the normalized constant is coming from a high dimensional integration. So MSMC is essentially a Monte Carlo algorithm to kind of approximate that integral. So in a lot of cases, if your problem is complicated or if your dimension is high, that algorithm can mix or can convert super slow. It can might be, it may require exponentially, it may require time that exponentially in your number of samples, which is not practical or maybe in your dimension of your problem. So that's the main issue. Also, usually it depends on how you design the Mark chain, which in a lot of cases is very hard to design. Also very sensitive to initialization. But anyway, if you turn this into an optimization problem, there are a lot of kind of cutting edge tools that you can utilize to make this very efficient. Any other question? No further question, let's thank Thank you so much.